Good morning. morning. One of the reasons I love that version of Cinderella is because there's a very important principle, and you could miss it right there, is she turns around and says, I forgive you. So you need to understand something about reaping and sowing. Even though someone may have... By the way, we don't always just reap and sow what we plant. Sometimes it's what other people. So some of you, at no fault of your own, were hurt by other people and had things planted in your life that aren't fair and they're not right. And I don't... Listen, I don't want you to mix up forgiveness. Forgiveness is not saying what they did was okay. But what forgiveness is, is forgiveness is saying, I choose to release you. You don't have to say it's okay. You don't have to justify it. You don't have to give up justice, all those things. But the truth is, if you don't forgive someone, forgive someone in your past, someone who hurts you, then you are carrying seeds of anger and bitterness forward in your life, and not just planting them in your life, you're planting them in the lives of the people around you. And most of us know somebody who's bitter and angry and frustrated, and aren't they a joy to be around? But the truth for all of us is if we don't actively go out of our way to forgive, to pursue forgiveness in our lives, we all, we all can struggle with that. Now, on the other side, if we allow God to plant seeds in our lives of blessing, spend time in God's word, spend time in prayer, allow God to do that, then it will change us. So I want to tell you about a zucchini attack. And um, it was really funny because I said to, I told, I said, Randy, because Randy's from the Midwest, I said, Randy, have you heard of a zucchini attack? And he looked at me like, what? And then he said, oh, he knew exactly what I was talking about. So I'm going to tell you about it because I had never heard about it. And actually, National Zucchini Attack Day was the eighth of this month, so you missed it already. But here's why, here's why. So apparently, what I don't, has anybody in here ever planted zucchini? Okay, some zucchini planters here. So maybe you learned, if you plant zucchini in the right soil, with the right ingredients, with the the right setting for zucchini, you will have too much zucchini. And so what happens in the Midwest when somebody moves to certain cities in the Midwest is, you know, if you're coming from Chicago or you're coming from Miami and you move to the Midwest and you move in, all of a sudden one of your neighbors shows up, knocks on the door and brings you two bags of zucchini and you say, oh, that's so thoughtful. Thank you so much. You think. And then the next neighbor comes and everybody brings you zucchini till you tell them no. And then it's become a joke over the years. They actually have national leave a zucchini on your neighbor's porch. And you can't get caught. Apparently, that's a Midwestern thing. Like, they're so nice, you have to, like, leave it without them knowing. And so I said, Randy, have you ever heard of of zucchini attack? And he's like, oh, you mean when you leave it on your neighbor's doorknob? I'm like, yeah, that's exactly. Okay, so you've seen it. So you can actually Google this and find news reports on this, which is hilarious. Has anybody ever heard of this other than me? And the only reason I've heard of it is because I looked it up. And so, so here's the thing. So what happens? If you move to a town, and let's say you went to church this Sunday in the Midwest at a certain town, and they were a zucchini wonderland. If you'll notice when you pull up, even though it's the middle of summer, Every window of every car is up. In the Midwest, where it's very safe, every car is locked. Because if you leave your windows down, or if you leave your car unlocked, when you come out of church, your back seat is full of zucchini. (laughs) They give zucchini, and so they've actually started all over the Midwest, different cities, there are zucchini festivals, and that's their way of getting rid of a lot of zucchini. Why? Because zucchini multiplies. Let me tell you about your life. Jesus over and over talks about sowing and reaping. He talks about planting. He talks about the farmer spreading seeds. There's over and over. And here's the thing. When you do what God wants you to do and you plant seeds of righteousness, 
then God multiplies it in your life. But the danger is when you allow what somebody else has planted in your life, whether it's a hurt in your life or something that you carry around or you uh, watch and pursue the wrong things. And, and by the way, how do we reap? How do we sow? It's what we watch. It's what we do. It's who we reach out to. It's what we focus on. And so if you this week were focused on doom, despair, and agony on you, well, you're going to reap that. And so if you start to say, these are the blessings that I have. God made us that way. Why? Because reaping and sowing is a real thing. So today we're going to talk about this whole idea. And here's what I want to ask you. And I want you to look. Because I want you to do two things from this sermon every day. I want you to say, God, help me pull any weeds that have been planted in my life. Uh, maybe you have a weed of anger. Maybe you have a weed of unforgiveness. Maybe it's bitterness over something. Maybe it's a reaction that you tend to have in traffic. Did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. Okay, whatever it is, say, God, help me to pull that weed. But then I want you to do another thing. I want you to say, God, help me to plant blessings this week. So every day, look for, how can I bless somebody? By the way, that doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be something big. Maybe it's just smiling at somebody. Maybe it's writing a nice note to somebody. Maybe it's just a, a, a text of encouragement or asking somebody how they're doing or checking on a neighbor or mowing somebody's grass or bringing somebody soup. Whatever it is, God, help me every day to not only pull the weeds in my life that I've planted in many cases in my life, but help me also to plant seeds of blessing. Now, here's the principle of the harvest, and I don't know if you've ever heard this. We're, we're using this today, but it's actually in a different order and because of the story. The principle of the harvest is this. You reap what you sow, you reap later than you sow, and you reap more than you sow. Now, we're going to do it in a little different order because of the story today, but that's the principle of the harvest. If you've never heard that, remember that. Teach your children that. Here we go. Number one. Consequences take time. So we're picking up in Esther chapter 7, and we'll go into chapter 8, because the story doesn't really end in chapter 7. It really, this part of the story ends in chapter 8. By the way, you do realize that when the Bible was written, they didn't have chapters and verses. It wasn't like they took the scroll out and said, turn to chapter 8. <laughs> what chapter? 8? Oh. Right? Okay, so, you know, they would read through the whole thing. So, so here's the thing. They didn't have it, so don't think that, you know, and so this story actually fits better to me into chapter 8, so we're going to go there today. So consequences take time. By the way, that's good consequences and bad consequences. It's when you do what's right. By the way, some of you will do what's right, and you won't reap in this lifetime. What, you, what you're sowing, God notices, though. By the way, know that, too. Because I've heard everybody say, no good deed goes unpunished. What a terrible thing that we say. But the truth is, no good deed goes unnoticed by God, regardless of whether anybody else notices. So here we go. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. Remember, this was banquet number two. Okay? This is how patient Esther is with what's right. He, she walks in the first time. And he says, what is it you want? To which I would have been saying, help. She says, I'd like you to come to a banquet. And, and so they have banquet number one. And then he asks her again, anything you want. Any way you want it. That's the way you need it. Any way you want it. Right? And she says, come to another banquet. So this is banquet number two. Now remember that Haman in the meantime had to walk Mordecai around the city, saying king for a day. And his wife, right before he leaves for this banquet, goes, you are in big trouble. So he shows up this banquet, but he has no idea that Esther is Jewish. But he's getting ready to find out. Here we go. And so they were drinking wine on the second day of the second banquet. The king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? even up to half the kingdom, it'll be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. That is my petition, which he had to be like, what? And spare my people, this is my request. By the way, she had obviously thought this out. She took her time. She laid the groundwork. She knew what she was doing. By the way, most of us, when we're communicating with other people, the mistake we make is we communicate out of passion 
anger, fear, terrible ways to communicate. Esther gave this a lot of time. She says, spare my people, this is my request. And then I love this. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. And the king had to be like, who? And then she butters up the king a little more. She says, you know, king, if we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, you know, if I was dragged out of this castle and just made a slave, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing, which means damaging, the king. So how does she start? She starts by saying, somebody's trying to kill me, which, by the way, Haman had to be going, who's trying to kill her? And then she says to the king, you know, if it was only slavery, but they're trying to kill me, but, you know, if, if I was an indentured bond servant the rest of my life, no big deal, and I wouldn't even bother you with this because you're so awesome, I wouldn't even want to mention this to you. So what is she doing? Consequences. She's laying the groundwork. Listen, God is always working in your life. And I know sometimes when you're going through life, it seems so unfair. And you're looking over there and you're saying, that person is doing this, this, and this, and they seem to always get away with it. And I'm struggling over here with this and this. And here's what I will tell you. Continue always to do what God, listen, has called you to do. Esther's main focus is not on Haman. Her main focus is on her people. Her main focus is on doing what God wants her to do. Now, can I tell you just a secret about my patience? When my cousin came to me and said in the book of Eric, hey, go see the king and tell him not to kill us all. This is what the story would have looked like. And Eric ran into the kingdom and was killed ran into the king's presence, and was instantly killed. The end. Right? And, and that's how most of us are. We are not patient people. What did she do? First, she carefully goes in to see the king. And then she, even then, she doesn't give him the request. And then she has banquet number one where he asks the same question, and she doesn't give the request. What is she doing? She's putting her emotions aside, and she's being wise. Be careful that you don't let your emotions run your mouth. Be careful that you don't let your emotions run your actions. If you allow your emotions to run you, you are going to find frustration and challenges. Listen to what it says in James chapter 5. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. And then it says, see how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Now, most of us aren't farmers, but we all have something, whether it's a rose bush. I have a brown thumb. Anybody else have a brown thumb, right? And so, and so what, whatever we have, there are times where it seems like, is, is that dead? And a farmer looking at a field after they plow, it looks dead. And what's he doing? He's waiting. He knows what's next. Here's the truth for you. When you do what's right and you wait for God, patiently wait for God, you can have joy even when you don't see any fruit from what you're doing. And there'll be times that you'll continue to do what's right and it'll feel like, well, I keep doing what's right and nothing seems to change. Or sometimes I keep doing what's right and things get worse. Years ago, they had a test called the marshmallow test. And I don't know if you've ever, anybody ever seen that with the little kids? It's gone on now for, I think, 25 years. The first one was like 25, 30 years ago. And so they've tracked these children as they've grown up. And here's what they would do. Let me take a drink real quick. Here's what they would do. They would bring a kid in. They'd put him in a room where they could watch him. They would put one marshmallow on a plate. And they would say, if you can wait five minutes, we'll give you two marshmallows. And so they've got videos of all these kids. It's hilarious. The ADD kid is there, <laughs> sniffing the marshmallow, licking the marshmallow, looking at the marshmallow, playing with the marshmallow. The cool and collected kid is sitting there just... Other kids aren't paying attention. There's all kind of things going on. And... What they discovered is the kids who would, and some kids, by the way, as soon as a person leave, 
right? And what they discovered was the kids who learned how to wait, it changed their life. And later on, those kids had better skills when it came to people and life. But here's the truth for all of us. We all struggle sometimes with waiting to see what God is going to do. My mom posted this yesterday. Never seek revenge. Rotten fruit will fall by itself. You just stay connected to the vine. We tend to want to attack what's hurting us. And yet God sometimes says to us, just wait, just be patient. I remember reading a book by John Ortberg where he was teaching about patience. And he said, we get in such a hurry that we go to the grocery store and we go to get in line and we look and we count the number of people in every line. And then we pick what we think is the best line. And then we look up and the person has that coupon book, right? Or they're using a check. And apparently they've never written a check in their life and they're trying it out, right? And so we look for the shortest line. And then, if you're like me, as you start to walk out, you look back to see, did you beat the people, right? How many do that? Come on, there's some people. See, see, I'm not alone. I'm not a total idiot, just partial. Okay, so so here's the deal. Here's what he said to do. Slowing means you purposefully pick the long line. And take time to thank God that you have the ability to buy groceries. Slowing means, this is, listen, this is going to hurt. Don, hang on, this is going to be painful. Slowing means you get in the right lane on I-95 and give the person in front of you space. I know. Why? And the truth is, in the middle of that, you say, God, I'm doing this because I want to focus on you and not focus on trying to get from one place to the other. And by the way, if you're like me, you have discovered yourself hurrying when you shouldn't even be in a hurry somewhere. You ever ever found yourself like driving fast and you're like, where am I going? They're not going to be there anyway. What? Why am I hurrying? We went to the airport last night, and my sister-in-law didn't say she got her bag yet, so I did that whole get in the slow side. It was like a foreign exercise for me, like, what? Even Kristen's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm trying to go slow. (laughs) It's a new experience for me. (laughs) People are just passing me, and I'm like, thank you. And then when I went to leave... Now I was in a hurry, and I'll teach you a secret. This has nothing to do with the sermon, but I'm going to teach you a secret. You know, Teslas have auto brakes. So if a Tesla's coming up next to you and doesn't want to let you in, just give it a little bump, and they'll stop because the car stops them. I did it twice last night. Sorry. Okay. No matter what, you're going to learn something in church. It may not be spiritual. So let me tell you something I've learned now that I've confessed my sins to everyone. We are microwave people with a crockpot God. We are, I'm a microwave person. I want everything now. God, yesterday would be good. You know, I'm ready for this to happen. Just make it happen. If you have teenagers, you get this, right? It's like, when when are they going to figure it out? When did you figure it out? Oh, let's not talk about that. Number two. So not only do consequences take time, we reap what we sow. Parents, I want to encourage you, teach your kids this principle. I don't want you to be a jerk about it. You don't have to be uh, 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 militant about it. But, you know, devices are great things to take away. My favorite story, and it's such my favorite. Some of you have heard it 32 times, but I'm going to tell it again because I think it's such a great thing. One day we left church. I had $11 in my pocket and four kids, and me. And I said, kids, you guys want McDonald's? Yeah, we want McDonald's! And I said, all right, we're getting the dollar menu. Now, this tells you how long ago it was. We're getting the dollar menu. We are not getting Happy Meals, and you can't complain. That's okay, Daddy. We'll take hamburgers and Coke or chicken nuggets or whatever it was on the dollar menu. And so we pulled in, and I asked the kids, what do you want? And the kids started saying, we want Happy Meals. We want Happy I said, listen, no, no, no. Dollar menu, 
or we go home. Bah, we want my way. And I'll never forget. And now you know why McDonald's has trapped you and not let you out. Because as I pulled up to the speaker, the kids started complaining, and I pulled the car away. And you could hear in the back seat, oh, no. And we went home, and I made peanut butter and sadness sandwiches and handed them to the children. But here's the best part. And I even asked Ricky last night. I said, Ricky, do you remember this story? He goes, heck, yeah. The next time we pulled into McDonald's, this is what it sounded like. Father, what would you like us to order today from Mr. Donald's place? What would you like? Every time we would just pull in and the kids were like, what can we get today, Father? What happened? They reap what they sowed. Now, typically, reaping and sowing is not so quick, but it's wonderful when it is. Parents, if you have control of the internet, you are in complete charge. But you can't say, I'm going to turn it off for weeks or months. It doesn't work. But you can give them little things. Taking away devices is a wonderful thing. Look for those opportunities to teach them that they reap what they sow. Because listen, listen, you all work with somebody who doesn't know this. And they, exactly. And they <laughs> never, take that person's phone away. They never... Learned it. So teach your kids consequences. Here we go. So King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Which I'm sure Haman was sitting there going, yeah, who is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing, Esther said, an adversary and an enemy. She still didn't say his name. And then she looks at him and she says, this vile Haman. This is the... Yanigo Mentoyo moment. Hello. My name is Esther. You tried to kill my family. Prepare to die. She had rehearsed this. She was ready to go. She, she had practiced this. And so then she said, then Haman was terrified. And this word terrified in the Hebrews means the terror came on him like the spirit used to come on Saul. It's the same word. It's this whole idea that all of a sudden he was like, Oh, no. Before the king and queen, the king got up in a rage. He left his wine. I love that little detail. Like this king loved wine. He didn't even bring his glass with him. That's like me leaving my coffee at home, right? It's like, and Eric left his coffee at home. Oh, he must have been really crazy that day, right? And so the king leaves his wine behind. Why? Because he's going to catch his breath in the garden. But Haman, realizing the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, listen to this, Haman fell on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaims, will he even molest the queen while she's with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. That is a mafia move right there. The king's like, what are you doing? Shoop, out the door. Remember, Haman was wealthy. Haman was a billionaire in our society. He was used to getting what he wanted, and yet here he was reaping what he had sowed. And Esther was also reaping what she had sown. She didn't get in a hurry. She didn't get impatient. She didn't let her emotions take control. She, didn't, she was wise in the way she did things. She knew who she was dealing with. And there's so many principles there of how she dealt with it without allowing her emotions to run it. Once again, the book of Eric would have ended with, King, I need your... That would be the story. The end. And they lived sad ever after. That's what it was. Listen to what it says in Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God can be, not be mocked. A man reaps what he sowed. So what are you sowing? If you've been hurt by somebody, like I talked about at the beginning of the sermon, if you don't forgive them, you will carry the seeds that they planted in your life and you'll spread those to other people. Bitter people and hurt people hurt people. And so you have to forgive. Why? To pull those weeds you have to begin to say, God, I want to do what you've called me to do. Listen to what Ralph Waldo Emerson said. I always thought John Maxwell said this first, but he didn't. Sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act 
and you reap a habit. So a habit, you reap a character. So a character, you reap a destiny. So continue to just plant those blessings. Pull those weeds, plant those blessings. Number three, we reap more and later than we sow. And here's the truth. Some of you, when you look back through the history of your family, you have a cycle of abuse. You have a cycle of pain. My mom grew up in an alcoholic home. When she was young, thankfully, somebody came by the house and asked her, do you and your sister want to come to church with us? She said, yes. She started going. She became a Christian. When my mom became a Christian, my grandmother laughed at her and made fun of her. Thankfully, my grandmother and grandfather became Christians years later. But the truth was, in our family, there were cycles of alcoholism, abuse, all through the history of our family. And what did my mom say? No more. She never focused on what anybody else did. She just did what God called her to do. And I want you and I to do this. Listen to chapter 8. Then Harbona, one, we're getting to chapter 8, the end of 7 here. One of the eunuchs attending the king said, A pole reaching height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. I love that he's the guy who brought Haman over, and apparently Haman was a jerk to him. So he's like, hey, by the way, I got this graded, right? He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Verse 8, chapter 8. That same day, King Xerxes, listen, gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, and Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, what gave him authority, the credit card of the kingdom. He took it off, he had re, uh, reclaimed it from Haman, I don't want to go into what that means, and presented it to Mordecai, and Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Jesus talks about sowing and reaping in Matthew 25 and Luke 19, but there's all kind of parables that when we sow, and by the way, what we sow on earth also affects what we receive in heaven. So don't think just because you don't see results that God's not going to bless you. In Galatians 6, it says this, whoever sows to please this to their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And then I love this, let's not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So what are you sowing into your life? What weeds are you pulling? Ask God every day, help me to pull those old weeds in my life. Maybe for your family, you're the place where the abuse, the hurt, the pain stops. And you ask God, God, give me a whole new generation. God, use the pain I've experienced to bless someone else. Instead of it being a thorn in my side, help it to make me more sensitive, more thoughtful, more caring, more loving, more kind. And God can do that. He can restore what the enemy steals. And he can change what has been a pattern of hurt in your family into a pattern of love and a blessing. So I pray that for you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's the first step to planting good seeds in your life is to allow the Holy Spirit to come in you to change your direction forever. So if you want to talk after the service about what it means to be a Christian, I'd love to talk to you. Maybe you're here this morning and as I talked, you realize, oh no. It's all right. That's what confession's about. God, I was wrong. Turn my heart towards you. Let's close in prayer today. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time together. I pray. Father, I pray for that one this morning that's struggling with unforgiveness, that's struggling with frustration. Maybe they're struggling with the pain from their family or friends or somebody else who hurt them. Lord, would you help them to walk through that the right way? And Lord, also, I pray for each person here that as they read your word, as they pray that you would plant seeds of blessing that would overflow to others. Help us to go out of our way to bless other people, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.